Welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. Today we're doing a bit of a quick follow-up. In a prior video, I looked at Mark Rober's SatGus satellite. This is a small private CubeSat designed to send down selfies. Uh, it's part of YouTuber Mark Rober's Crunch Labs. Now I've sent off a selfie, or more accurately a selfie of my cats, but I'd like to snoop on the satellite more in person and see what kind of radio signals can we get directly from this satellite. In the prior video, I didn't really know much about the satellite. We did not know exact orbital elements, we didn't know the exact position in orbit around the Earth, and we didn't know anything about the radio frequencies. Now, almost as soon as I published that video, the orbital elements were also published on the NORAD tracking databases and websites like in2io.com, Celestrack, and other apps, websites, and programs that you can use to track satellites. So now we have a little bit more information about where this satellite is, and we can aim antennas at it. For a small CubeSat like this, it has a relatively low transmitter power, so you need to aim a directional antenna pretty much at the satellite to get the best radio signal. Satellites like this use a variety of radio frequencies, UHF in the 400 to 500 megahertz range, and S-band you might already be familiar with because it includes Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz. Now each of these frequencies uses a different type of antenna. For UHF we're going to use something called a Yagi Uda or Yagi antenna. And for S-band I'm going to be using a modified television satellite dish with a custom 3D printed S-band feed on the front. Now I don't know if we're actually going to get any images or any usable data a, because the ground stations are a little bit farther away from me. I live in Minnesota, the ground stations are somewhere over in California, and the satellite is only going to be transmitting the main payload data when it's over a ground station. It won't be transmitting that just all over the world the way weather satellites, NOAA series, Meteor series, those transmit everywhere because they're public access and anybody can receive that. Now the UHF frequency on this satellite might be transmitting everywhere because that sends down telemetry data, just basic health information about the satellite, voltages, temperatures, things like that. I also don't know if I'll be able to decode any of that because it's probably in a proprietary format, possibly an encrypted format, but we can still look around for the signal. Now the orbital data that was just published is in something called a two-line element or sometimes three-line element format. This is basically just a text shorthand that defines a satellite's orbit. We know the time, we know our location, we can figure out when is the satellite passing overhead. So we'll add that tracking number to gpredict and update our TLE data. And there it is, now it shows up in the tracking list and we can add it over here. This one down here is the old tracking information from the preliminary TLEs I had. Let's see how accurate is that. So this is the preliminary TLE and it says it's passing overhead in about 22 minutes. So let's compare that to the updated TLE. 27 minutes and a slightly different track. So if I were tracking this with the old preliminary TLEs, they are out of date and I would be slightly off on my tracking. Uh, it's cold out here again and the laptop is kind of freaking out a little bit. Satellite has just come over the horizon, so we're doing all of the usual tracking on the laptop here. We have the Python code running that RV dish as a rotor. We have gpredict telling the Python code where to point and we have STR++ running a Hacker F1 software defined radio listening to the 400 megahertz UHF band. All these solid lines here are just interference. That's from 5G local Wi-Fi, possibly my laptop and my camera. I always get a lot of interference out here because I'm in the city, so radio frequency noise is just something I kind of have to live with. Much less frequent pulses of data here, and they did seem to go from just above 400.2 to just below, so I'm guessing that's it. I'm seeing nothing from the S-band tracking dish. Those signals on the right are just terrestrial interference that I saw before the pass started, so we've seen no identifiable signals on S-band from SatGus, which is kind of to be expected. I believe it is only going to be dumping or transmitting S-band downlinks when it's over one of the operating company's ground stations. I think there's one in Pasadena, California, there's one up in Fairbanks, Alaska, there's some in Europe. There's nothing really close to me here in the Midwest, so there's no reason for it to be transmitting S-band because there's no ground station nearby to be receiving it here. Okay, we're trying this again. Today we have a pretty distant pass off to the west, and I'm hoping that the southwest portion of this will overlap in radio coverage between me and California. So hopefully SatGus will turn on its S-band downlink transmitter somewhere 
around the middle of the pass to the last part of the pass. So once again, I'm running HackRF Spectrum Analyzer. We are looking at kind of the existing S-band, 2.2 gigahertz to 2.4 gigahertz, uh, before the satellite passes overhead. And there's a lot of interference up here at the top end. Wi-Fi is up here starting around 2.4, so there's a lot of other services that use this end of S-band. I am potentially seeing something here around uh, 2260 megahertz. We're definitely starting to lose visibility to the satellite. As you can see up here from this polar graph display, it's almost to the horizon, so I kind of doubt my dish will see anything. And that questionable signal that I was wondering about has disappeared. I moved the dish manually back up to the middle of the pass position where we started to see that signal, that uh, 2262 megahertz signal. I don't see it again, so that tells me it probably was not some terrestrial interference that just happened to hit the dish at the right angle. That reinforces my belief that we might have been seeing SatGus there. Alright, we're trying to track SatGus again. We are narrowing in on a smaller frequency range since I think I saw some activity around 2262 to 2263. Uh, megahertz. We're going to focus on that area. So we are definitely in the radio footprint for SatGus. There, something just popped into view. And yeah, the satellite is in a good orientation over the ground station, so this might be the data download. This might be the S-band download right there, the dump. It is way too faint, I think, for me to do anything with it. That is a very faint signal for me, but um, I think that might be Sat Gus's S-band downlink right there. Those are people's selfies being downloaded, presumably. And that signal is fading out as the satellite drops towards the horizon, as expected. So that actually matches uh, the orbital path of the satellite as far as the signal strength that we're seeing here. So that tells me we're probably on the right track. We are probably seeing Sat Gus. While we didn't see a really strong signal, I didn't really expect to see a super strong signal. I am right at the edge of being able to hear that satellite when it dumps to Pasadena. So to be able to see anything at all is actually a pretty good result. And I think now we know what frequencies Sat Gus is using. 400.2 megahertz for the telemetry data and 2262.5 gigahertz for the S-band downlink. That's information that could be potentially useful for somebody who lives closer to one of these Earth stations. I'll throw the map up again from the Satellite Operating Company's website that shows where all of their Earth stations are. So if you live near one of these stations in a good uh, area for reception, you could try receiving SatGus on either of those frequencies. I think with the telemetry frequency, we could probably hear that just about wherever. It should be transmitting telemetry essentially 24-7, or as long as it has enough power for that. And then the dumps, the data downloads, happen right around these ground stations. So I can't really do anything with the payload data because it's too faint and it's probably encrypted. So we're going to set that aside for now, and I'm going to go back and look at the telemetry data again. I recorded some telemetry from SatGus on 400.2 megahertz, and you can easily tell this is from a low Earth orbit satellite because of the Doppler shift. As the satellite goes overhead, the frequency decreases relative to me on the ground. So relative to that center red line, you can see the signal creeping downwards in the frequency range. SatGus seems to be sending out a telemetry burst about every 10 seconds. From what I can find online, this is probably 9600 baud frequency shift key. That's a pretty standard digital radio modem protocol. Now I'm getting some information from a project called SatNogs, which is something that I've been meaning to look into more, so maybe this is a good excuse to research it. It is kind of an open source satellite ground station project. Trying to decode this recording into some kind of digital data requires me to run this through a program called Direwolf, which is basically a software modem similar to an old packet radio TNC. While I was Googling how to set up Direwolf and how to set up some of these scripts to decode the baseband, um, Google apparently thinks that uh, this is so depressing and problematic that I might need some mental help. I had a few issues decoding my baseband file. I was able to find a better recording online that somebody else made, ran that through the Direwolf decoder, and we get kind of gibberish. It's encrypted, or at least in a format that I don't understand. We do get a call sign here, GRAF1N, which is probably SatGus's radio call sign, so that's cool, but we can't really get much out of the data. Even the telemetry data is fairly incomprehensible. So that's where I'm going to end this second attempt, and 
possibly my last attempt at looking at SatGuss. Everything seems to be encrypted. We've figured out two frequencies, the telemetry channel and the data payload channel, but there's nothing that we can really see as a casual amateur user because it's a commercial satellite, it's encrypted, and thus it's not very interesting to satellite amateurs. I'm probably going to move on to some more interesting open source publicly available satellites, amateur radio repeater satellites, scientific satellites, of course the weather satellites that I've looked at before. I've got some new ideas for my motorized antenna rotor, for decoding different satellite signals. I'm going to look into that SatNOGS program a little bit more because that's something pretty interesting. And as I start working with more CubeSats, more small satellites, that's something that I'd like to learn more about. Thank you to all my Patreon supporters who help make this channel possible. I will throw some names up here of the folks in the $10 and $20 a month tier, the producers and executive producers. Thanks again to everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time.